Okay, we're back here live inside theCUBE, Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage of OpenStack here in Portland. I'm John Furrier, joined with my co-host Jeff Frick, and our next guest is Josh McKenty, who's the CTO and founder of uh, Piston Cloud. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much. So tell us first about uh, what you guys do as a business, then we'll jump into uh, the OpenStack conversation. Sure, so we take uh, OpenStack and we deliver a software product for use in building enterprise private clouds. And is that on bare metal or is that service? Yeah, everything from bare metal up. So we don't sell hardware, we sell just software, but we include hypervisor, we include virtual storage, we include virtual networking, orchestration, installer, you name it. Um, well our tagline is typically cloud in 10 minutes. So um, Sean Douglas from Service Mesh was giving you guys a lot of compliments when I asked him the question what people should uh, do to get involved in the community. He said, you know, contact some of the thought leaders and mention Piston Cloud as one of them. Um, what is happening with OpenStack? Share with the folks out there why OpenStack's mm -hmm. so hot right now and, and uh, why is all the excitement this year of, of all the other events? Sure, so I think uh, Sean maybe gives me a little too much credit for, for having perspective in the sense that I've been doing OpenStack I think longer than anyone. Uh, the first release of OpenStack source code was on my blog in, in uh, 2010. Um, so I have no perspective at all. <laughs> like if you ask me about the Grizzly release, it's a blur. It's like four years of unbelievable growth. Um, I think what's sort of fitting this time around is that the summit's actually in the Oregon Convention Center, uh, and this is where we we announced OpenStack to the world. This was where the first um, public announcement was made at, at OSCON that summer. So it's kind of nice to come back, come full circle, and, uh, and be in this building where originally you know, we had a handful of folks and now we have, uh, what, this count this week is 3,000, which is, is just insane. And, this, and they're expecting more at the next event. Yeah. What's definitely. the makeup of the community right now? Um, obviously, it um, was started with hardcore developers. You got a lot of suits here, mm -hmm. got some business here. Obviously, the, the big whales are here, IBM, HP, yeah. uh, VMware, other, other big public companies are here. And you, but you still get the startups emerging yeah. in and you get the developer community. What's that dynamic like? It's really fun, to be honest. So I sit on the OpenStack Foundation board. Uh, there are 24 uh, board members, and it's a really interesting mix because we have, we have small company startups, we have service providers, we have systems integrators, we have, you know, as you said, the, the IBMs, the Intels, the HPs, and, uh, and we manage to get together for these 10-hour meetings and get a lot of work done. You know, it's really, everyone in that room is there because we believe in, in kind of the vision of OpenStack and how it can change uh, what happens in the data center. And, uh, and we're all focused on that. Yeah, we were talking about the cloud wars earlier, how you know, the, the, the fight for the hypervisor, and then the game elevated around the conversation around you know, this idea for developers and, and, and building clouds, which is a bigger, bigger vision than just you know, uh, spinning up virtualization yeah. in the cloud. Um, and then now, the commentary here, obviously we're at OpenStack, is OpenStack one, it's the operating system of, of cloud builders. Um, that being said, um, what is the cloud war situation right now? Obviously, Amazon is doing very, very well. Um, are we in multiple cloud environments? Is it going to be that every, every company has multiple clouds? Um, and cloud brokering is a topic we've been right, kicking right. around. What's your take on where we are right now, given all this, I mean, look at just Microsoft. We were talking about Microsoft just in the last segment. Like, where are they? So, you got Microsoft, you got VMware, you got well, AWS. Well, then there's the, the Google. The Google keeps sprinkling in, but, I, but you would expect at some point in time the yeah. Google uh, volume would, would increase as well. There's, but there's no one size fits all cloud. So there is, a, there is some conversations around, hey, how do you put a frame around this? How do you get customers getting value out of that? So, yeah. so what's your take on all this? It's a great question. You know, there are folks who are very much that everything will be public cloud eventually, they believe that we all converge in public cloud. I'm not of that camp. I look at the internet as a great example, and I say, okay, well the internet became incredibly powerful because we have private networks and public networks built out of the same protocols. And so if you look at OpenStack as being sort of two communities in one, we have the, the private cloud vendors and we have the public cloud operators. Uh, certainly in the public cloud, uh, Amazon is the big incumbent, and I think the cloud wars, as you put them, are really between Amazon and the OpenStack clouds at this point. And we see Rackspace and HP and IBM and, and others as being the new entrants in that market. Um, I think in the long term, this looks very much like the Linux ecosystem in the private space in that we will have a few pure plays that will have a handful of also-rans. Yeah. Um, every market eventually becomes a two-horse race. 
Right. So VMware is definitely one of those horses, <laughs> and the other one's clearly OpenStack, but we're not sure Set which OpenStack. Set of steak knives for, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And coffee for the winners, as they say. Right. So, so, okay, let's go back. So we've, I've been following the whole OpenStack thing in Rackspace, pre-OpenStack, mm -hmm. pre prehistoric OpenStack, we, as we called it earlier. Um, and I was critical, I mean, I'm a big fan of OpenStack, always have been, but I was, you know, really critical on the blog about some of the early days of OpenStack. It felt like, you know, a pool party, everyone jumping in for a splash for a marketing hype. Right. You know, hey, you know, Amazon's kicking ass, they have no cloud strategy, you know, put, you know, say OpenStack and we're all kind of kumbaya, and, and, and those industry kind of partnerships become like a Barney deal, you know, everyone loves each other, but nothing's <laughs> happening. So, you know, that was my statement, I was afraid of that. Mm -hmm. You saw some signs. Um, but it changed quickly. It did, a lot of people were afraid that OpenStack was more marketing hype than actual solid code, and I never had that fear because I was inside yeah. the code, right? So we saw, when we launched OpenStack Nova, uh, very shortly after we started writing it, it was about 6,000 lines of code. If you look at OpenStack today, it's more than one and a quarter million. So that's, that's an enormous rate of growth. Actually, Olo figures OpenStack is, is about 200 man years worth of effort. And, and the thing that happened is the, the companies that joined the community actually put in the work. Yeah, their marketing departments got really excited. There were a lot of press yeah. releases. There were a lot of announcements. We do a lot of speaking engagements. You know, yeah. we're on video interviews like this. <laughs> but folks are still doing the work. They're still moving the ball forward. What was forward. the tipping point? Was it just the, the, the plowing the fields with good content, good code? Um, the contributors themselves. Um, was, mean, it, the was, it, was it network virtualization? SDN seemed to kick things up a notch. Or validation like here, from the big by whales. VMware. I mean, was there, to was be there honest, a flashpoint? So, so here's, uh, I've been working on Interop for the last few months in the context of the board, and I'm leading a panel later this week, and I was quoted in the press last week talking about it. When we launched OpenStack, the NASA team, my team, and the Rackspace team were 100% incompatible. We had zero Interop in OpenStack, even though, you know, so at that yeah. moment in time, it was as much marketing hype it has ever been. And we've been converging that since then. I'd say we're 80% we're there. There was some point around the Diablo release where we actually got the auth piece working. You know, where literally you could use one set of credentials and you could use all the different OpenStack services, and that was the point where people said, okay, well now it starts to feel like it works. It feels real. They yeah. can put their hands on it. Yeah. It wasn't yeah, like infighting. That's good governance, though. That's, you, you know, you guys, I got to say, one thing, I, you know, props to the OpenStack community mm -hmm. was they really moved quickly around solid governance. And, you well, know, so we got a ton of criticism for that in the first year, because, be, I mean, our original governance structure was two NASA people, two Rackspace people, go. Yeah. Right, it was really more of the benevolent <laughs> dictator model than, than yeah. we have evolved away from. And then we tried this thing called the Project Oversight Committee, we renamed it to the Project Policy Board, we changed the election structure for that two or three times, and eventually we buckled down and put the nonprofit foundation together last year. Um, we've really rapidly iterated, we've probably iterated on our governance faster than we iterated on code, and it's worked out really yeah, well. Yeah, that's good investment though. Yeah, it's interesting. Absolutely. So now that you've gotten here, and it's, it's mm. exciting, and it's big, and it's real, what's the next challenge from the foundation's point of view, um, that this kind of the next summit? Where's, where, where are the next priorities over the next that's, uh, that's little great, piece of time? That's a great question. Um, you know, the, the original goal with OpenStack really was to reach the state of the art. You know, to say, hey, if we're going to call this cloud, and by cloud we really mean the software-defined data center, or software-defined everything, we've got to have storage that's best of breed, we've got to have virtual networking that's best of breed, and we have to have our compute layer as best of breed. We've got that done now. You know, we've got Cinder matured, we've got Quantum matured, we've got Nova matured. Now, we have this amazing challenge to, as a community, roll the ball forward. Where do we go for innovation? The last summit I gave a speech on Paracloud, sort of talking about this idea of how does OpenStack become the perfect platform for every platform as a service offering. So whether that's OpenShift or Cloud Foundry or Cumulogic or CloudBlees or JCloud or you have it, um, how are we absolutely the best place? What can we do in the infrastructure layer to make the application developers more happy? It's not about the raw infrastructure anymore. Now it's about those, those value added services. Josh, I'm getting some tweets from some uh, folks who follow us. Uh, who aren't as geeky as us in the OpenStack world, oh dear. asked you to provide a uh, OpenStack 101. Yeah, they're hearing Diablo, Nova, all these kind of buzzwords. Mm. So just quickly, just give a OpenStack 101 for the audience. Sure. You know, what, they, what do they need to know? I can do it in five numbers, okay? OpenStack is one community around two kinds of clouds. That would be public clouds and private clouds. So in your own data center or somebody else's data center. It has three kinds of interfaces. So you've got a command line interface, you've got a web dashboard, and you've got a programmatic API. 
All three of those work in the same way, and they service the same things. Now, the fourth thing is you've got four kinds of resources exposed through those interfaces. So you've got two kinds of storage. That would be new object storage and old block storage. You've got virtual networks, and you've got virtual compute resources. So those are your four resource pools. And finally, you have five actors. This is the most confusing part, okay? You have vendors. <laughs> that would be folks like That's Piston confusing. Cloud. Who sell, <laughs> who sell clouds or cloud software. You have operators, the folks that run clouds, either, again, private or public. You have auditors. People forget about these guys. They're the ones Compliance. who have to look under the covers, yeah. but they're actually not delivering value. You have users, cloud users, meaning they connect to those APIs or the command line tools. And then you have end users. That's somebody who actually uses an application that's hosted on a cloud, and they may not even know it's hosted on a cloud. Right, so if you pull your phone out of your pocket that's and you an connect to any app on your phone, you're an end user of cloud, whether you realize it or not. So those are, that's OpenStack in five numbers. And then let me follow, and then what was the, what was either the, uh, the event that created the desire to create OpenStack, or what was kind of the, the mission, the really high level mission, okay. when you guys got together with however sure. many people you were uh, five years ago sure. in, here in lovely Portland? So I was running a team at NASA, and we had a mandate to do something about NASA's data and how they were building applications. And it was a very broadly defined mandate because it was Skunk Works unfunded project. Um, and we originally set out to build a platform as a service that, that the agency could use. Let me, and it, was yeah. it because their existing thing wasn't working well? Is it because they saw a new age of types of data or amount all, of all applications? Of the above. I mean, NASA had at least 300 data centers, didn't even know how to count them. Okay. Uh, thousands of applications okay. written in dozens of languages. So we had security concerns, we had cost concerns, we had legacy concerns, and really, NASA's mandate is to collaborate but we can't let people at our infrastructure because it's also one of the most secure government agencies. And so we were trying to build something on the inside of NASA that looked like things folks could run on the outside. That was the path to open source. Okay. Was to say, if we build this as an open source technology, we can use it, other people can use copies of it, and we don't have to you know, give them tunnels through our firewall every day. Which sounds ridiculously uh, forward thinking for a big government agency to actually say, here with the, the crown jewels and some of the most secretive stuff I'm sure we have, um, as a government, let's use the open source model to drive the innovation to clean up the spaghetti sure. nightmare. So if you look at the team, uh, my team that, that built this at NASA, um, none of us were at NASA before this project and none of us are still there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was, more, it, was, <laughs> it was a very rare window in time. Sure. We had inspired leadership who said, you can go do this, figure something out. And Rackspace was a motivated party to enable another group. Absolutely. Because they didn't want to take it on their own. I remember talking to Lou, Lou and Jim, Lou Mormon and Jim Curry about mm -hmm. the time. Uh, they were like, hey, we, we, we're Rackspace, we have our own agenda, we want to yes. build a company. They had bought cloud sites and they're trying to cobble mm -hmm. that together, but they needed someone to step up. Absolutely. And the that partnership was really good was timing. The meeting when we first met with Lou and Jim and the Rackspace team, they brought about 17 people out to NASA Ames. We spent a full day together. It was probably the weirdest experience of my life, to be honest. It's a lot like meeting a long lost twin. You know, we sat down. Explain the meeting. So, <laughs> so um, we had a couple of hours blocked off for them to tell us what they had built and a couple of hours blocked off so f we could go over what we had built. Um, and it didn't work that way at all, right? They got up on the whiteboard and they said, so we're writing in Python. And we're like, oh, so are we. And we're like, well, we're using Twisted. So are we. Oh, so we use these brand of switches. Oh, so do we. And it was literally like every single technical decision we had made was identical. And we'd never met these people. We'd never talked to them. We didn't have common friends. We didn't have common backgrounds. And I'm like, well, you just wrote exactly what we were going to write next year when we had time. And they had exactly the same experience for us. And afterwards, like, okay, well, obviously this is happening. If it hadn't been that perfect of a fit, it wouldn't have happened because this was six weeks before the first summit. We had no time at all. Yeah, so good time. So you had a yeah. shared mission, shared vision, shared yeah. execution, and uh, had the personalities. You got the cowboys from Texas, you know. They're all, <laughs> all cool guys down there at Rackspace. But what was, the, what was the personalities like? It was, I would say, everyone other than the civil servants <laughs> had a blast. The civil <laughs> servants had a lot of trouble because we were all breaking rules, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> who's allowed to pay for dinner when you take 27 people out for dinner, right? Every single person had to pay for their own dinner that first night. Like, <laughs> That's good biz dev, <laughs> <Yes>. you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, great, great story, and, and a lot's happened since then. So, you know, you talked about the, the five things, the one-on-one -on -one for, mm -hmm. uh, for OpenStack. What do you think's going to happen as this goes forward? Because now you have a framework that's quite frankly in the, in the public markets, in the CIO space or in the enterprise, it's, it's, like a, it's a warm blanket for CIOs because they need 
they need some help around feeling comfortable around Absolutely. their issues, mm -hmm. which is like SLA, I need I got all this data protection issues, I have all application support, I want to hire mm -hmm. developers. And they're also going to a scale out open source model. Right. So that, that is scary, because it's not rack and stack, it's like I'm spreading servers all over the place, mm -hmm. and cloud is just another set of servers. So they don't know how to do that. The, so the, they're, <laughs> they're scared, and Amazon isn't like the most yeah. comforting. Right, well any single vendor is not the most comforting. <laughs> you know, if you live in, in the world of Microsoft for a couple of decades, you start to realize any one vendor controlling that much of the core part of your business is a little scary. Um, the thing that I'm looking forward to the most is OpenStack becoming very boring, to be honest, because uh, what we have done is unbelievably revolutionary, but what it does is it allows the application developers to do amazing things on top. Right? When you take those constraints away, so I'll give you an example. When they shipped the Apple One, right, Wozniak and Jobs came out with this computer, and for the first time ever, you could be a software engineer without being a hardware engineer. Right, you could write software without understanding computer chips. And this is when I started programming. I was six years old, I had an Apple II, and you didn't have to understand hardware. I'm not a hardware geek. I'm actually yeah. not good with hardware. So OpenStack has now done that to distributed systems. Application developers can now write software that can deal with a million concurrent users without understanding anything about scale. So yeah, now or, I'm really or excited. Or ops, for that matter. Or ops, yeah, don't touch the box. In fact, don't think about the box. Don't think about the filer, don't think about the network, just think about the application and the end user. Um, and so now I'm really excited that we get to just sort of disappear. The, the OpenStack community is really going to become irrelevant. What is the most disruptive thing that you think OpenStack is doing right now in the marketplace? <laughs> what are we not disrupting? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the most, what's the, yeah, the stack rank of top three? Top three, I would say storage is terrified right now. You know, because they have been the bastion of proprietary hardware, even more so than networking. Networking woke up to this a couple of years ago and said, hey guys, networking is going into the software, networking has to match what happened with virtualization, our hardware is going to become commodity, let's become software companies, right? SDN was born out of that. That was a giant disruption. Uh, the major networking vendors have adjusted pretty well to that, and they're moving now forward with their SDN offerings. The same thing's happening to storage. It's a giant bastion of proprietary hardware. It's being radically disrupted. If you go downstairs to the exhibit hall, Ceph and Solid Fire and Violin and Nimble and, and all of these new storage companies with new thinking where their value is in the software. Well, you have NetApp just running these two proposals and some code. They Absolutely. brought some code to the yep. table. They've been yep. there from five EMC's years. EMC's brought some code to the table. You know, yeah, it's pretty interesting. EMC's brought code to the table? Yeah. Mostly okay. through partners and channels and things. <laughs> but they, no, they joined the OpenStack Foundation officially. Last week? <laughs> no, no, actually, it was about the time of the it's last time summit. For the show. I had to dig on <laughs> EMC. We love EMC, by <laughs> yeah. the way. But, you know, sure. Well, Sean was on the, yeah. on the show a minute ago. Oh, so so he's he no longer works for EMC. Right. But yeah. well, what now, EMC's no longer involved in OpenStack. Now I was going to say, what about on the application side? So you've seen a lot of stuff. <laughs> what's, what's one of your favorite application stories that's been enabled by this, this completely change in, in the I would take I would take one of our customers. So uh, just as an easy, off the top of my head, because I talk to them all the time. So Radio Free Asia is uh, funded by, uh, it's a nonprofit funded primarily by the U.S. State Department, and they operate uh, internet services in Southeast Asian countries that have restrictive firewalls, right? So just think of dictatorships where you can't get access to media, you can't get access to the internet. Um, they run, you know, Tor nodes and Wi-Fi hotspots and uh, and local broadcast, local language broadcast. Was it? Did it come from what it sounds like when you say the name? Was it originally just the, the super giant uh, antenna on the on the ship? Offshore? Literally, literally, Blasting, yeah, free uh, radio okay. for these countries okay. with a democratic message. Okay. Now, um, it's incredibly dangerous to be on the ground in one of these countries and be associated with Radio Free Asia, right? Like we're thinking, you know, rubber hoses. Um, and so what they were looking for for infrastructure was a truly lights out software defined data center, which we were able to supply them. So there are no on the ground people at all. In fact, there's nobody on the ground in the country, let alone in the data center. Um, and so we support this remotely and we provide free internet access and local language broadcasting. I mean, when, when infrastructure is not something you have to think about anymore, what the application developers can do gets really exciting. It gets really revolutionary. That's that's one off the top of my head. Yeah, that's great. That's great. 
makes exciting times. It is very much so. So, um, final question is um, for the for the CIOs out there and, the, and people who have that legacy, mm -hmm. who are looking to OpenStack. I mean, I think everyone else on the, that's got a clean sheet of paper is pretty much on Amazon yeah. at this point, um, um, until you guys can make it boring and and uh, completely. A lot of people are coming uh, off yeah. Amazon right now. I really, that's hope. an that's an well, they're. Talking tomorrow morning. I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to spoil their announcement. You can describe what they're saying. What? Why they're leaving? Yeah. I mean, so there are a lot of SaaS companies or web scale SaaS companies. As they grow up, they've grown up on Amazon. Like Zynga. I like Zynga. Zynga is a great example. There are other companies that are uh, less gaming, more real businesses. And that's, not to and pick that's, on Zynga. And that's a scale where they can justify bare metal, right? So bare Most metal more. is cheaper than cloud at a scale of one rack. Well, not, not have to hire all the administrators and the managers. So manage, side. manage private cloud is the first step, and then running your own private cloud is the second step. But to be honest, cost is only one of those factors. The second factor is the customization, right? So you see modern applications more and more. You might have an in-memory database where you're looking at, hey, can we get a half a terabyte of RAM as opposed to maybe 96 gigs? What about a lot of SSDs? What about some Fusion IO gear? What about like the mix of hardware in the data center to push a next yeah. gen web yeah. app? Is it's there. not something you can buy from Amazon. Yeah, and it's all or, there right or now. Or if you can buy unless it, it's an Netflix. unbelievable Unless price. you're Netflix. Yes, uh, and then right. you get the Flash. Um, yeah, yeah, but Flash has changed the game in the, in, in the data center for sure. Absolutely. I mean, and with but open source. Do, yeah, do you know what you pay for Flash or SSDs at Amazon? I mean. Yeah, so they don't really offer them to everyone yet, but still. Sure. Um, 20x it's of, yeah. of what would be, what you could do it for yourself. Fully yeah. loaded yeah. cost with data center and everything yeah. else. And you know, the customers we talk to um, are saving literally 8x from Oracle and or VMware licenses by going open source with uh, scale out easily, in, in the easily, data center. Easy, easily not ADX, especially Oracle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Oracle's getting hammered right now. Um, so final well, question. Well, they bought Nimbula. You know, that's <laughs> an OpenStack member. I'm sure they can do something with that. Yeah, well, they need, they're now joining the OpenStack Foundation. <laughs> yes. We love Oracle. Purpose Build is coming, making a comeback. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it is, actually. We were talking about that earlier. That's yeah, a whole yeah. other conversation. That's final right. question, because we're getting tight on time. For the CIOs out there mm -hmm. who are really seriously excited and are tooling up or preparing to plan for a modern era infrastructure yes. on inside their premise and cloud, uh, what advice would you give them um, about you know, OpenStack's prospects and, and them in general on their side of their business? So the biggest challenge that they're facing, whether it's OpenStack or any other software-defined data center, is really that uh, the change is not about your software or hardware, it's a cultural change. And the culture that, that is driving this forward is the DevOps culture, right? So this is bridging developers and operations in a really fundamental way. The challenge for the CIO is that they only own the operations side of that business and they've jealously guarded it. So this is about letting down the walls of their organization and becoming a partner with the other C-level executives, particularly the marketing group who drives a lot of application development in a modern enterprise. Um, Look at that cultural change. Look at how do you really change how your operators execute in the data center and not what you're deploying. Because of, frankly, you know, OpenStack is certainly the best solution for the software-defined data center. It's not the only one. And the success of your project has way more to do with the cultural barriers to that adoption than it does to the technology. Okay, Josh McKenty, the uh, founder of Piston Cloud CTO here inside theCUBE, breaking it down. Great 101 on mm -hmm. OpenStack, uh, what you need to know, and just some great commentary around this uh, evolving and growing community around open source and scale up, scale out, open source. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>